All right. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us for the uh, second annual uh, ECMO breakout session here at the Sandbell Symposium. And thanks for everybody that's joining us live, tuning in. Um, we have four great speakers this, this year that I'm really excited about. Eric, he was here. He's going to start us off. He was here last year and did a phenomenal job with um, the mechanical ventilation. Um, and then we have Bill Harris, who's also a fantastic uh, speaker and an ECMO guru. We have uh, Cliff Marshall, who is also very experienced in ECMO, and David A. Bear, which is a ECMO director at um, in New Orleans. So, um, without further ado, we'll start with Eric Kreiner, and he'll come up and talk about mechanical ventilation. All right, excellent. So, good afternoon, um, and I'm all good. I can go. I'm good. All right, so. Um, I'm super happy to be back. Uh, I did this conference last year. I speak at about 20 conferences a year all over, and uh, I was just having a conversation. A lot of them are respiratory and critical care based. Um, this one's my only perfusion based. I don't know if there's any other ones, but I, I like it because it's out of my world. It's out of my like direct wheelhouse, and it's good to see all the other uh, disciplines and, and, and interests, and so it's really great. And um, it's also fascinating that these worlds overlap so much uh, and, and we can kind of learn off of each other. So, uh, so we're gonna get started. Um, we, I think, wanted to frame this a little bit uh, as we did yesterday, but with a little bit more time and attention to the detail for you guys, all right? And so in doing so, um, I'm not sure if we're monitoring online at all, the chat, um, I would like to make it as much as of a discussionary thing too, right? So it's a little bit different setting clearly than the big room. Um, if I need to explain something else or you wanna talk about something else that you've had in your experience that you feel is pertinent, uh, let's have it. Let's have the, th that discussion. Otherwise I can yap at you for hours, all right? I, honestly, I definitely could. All right, so um, conflict of interest. Uh, as I said, I do a bunch of different speaking and authorship. Um, and consultation with a bunch of different vent companies and that sort of thing. So that's uh, what I'll disclose here. I don't think it's really relevant to this particular talk. And all of everything in here are my pictures, my slides, and not um, reflective of anybody else. So that's the legalese in that. Uh, we will go through this. Um, so I guess the objectives as we start setting out is I think we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about the modes of mechanical ventilation. And this is hard for me because I don't know where to come in for you. Um, and this is where I'm kind of giving you the opportunity to get me on the right track, right? Like I can talk about basic, really super fundamental stuff, uh, or if that's too low and we need to talk about something else, then I'll have that conversation. I think it's, it's because of the size and, and our group here, it's, it's worthy of it. And then we'll talk about lung injury and some of the things that we do on the ventilator of, uh, for management during ECMO, all right? So in terms of fundamentals of mechanical ventilation, I think where you have to start is this premise and this idea that the ventilator can only really, really deliver two types of breath. Uh, one is a mandatory breath and one is a spontaneous breath. How you construct and shape and organize that breath is what makes a mode a mode. But when you kind of drill down and kind of dilute all the noise away, there's a mandatory breath and a spontaneous breath that is gonna come from the ventilator, okay? And so as we start to kind of explore those ideas, we'll go down the mandatory side first, all right? So in terms of the mandatory breath, if the patient is narcotized, anesthetized, paralyzed, whatever, does not have a respiratory drive, clearly in this case, you would have a, a set respiratory rate and that patient would be delivered each one of those breaths at that, set, that particular set respiratory rate. And I think really the difference in where we kind of start uh, uh, parsing things out is, well, what happens when the patient does wake up and start to try to tr trigger a breath, all right? And how does the ventilator interact and respond in that way, all right? And that's how we're going to find out and get to a mode of mechanical ventilation, essentially. So let's make up the scenario that the ventilator sees the patient's effort. It doesn't lock them out. It doesn't say, mm, I'm only set for a rate of 12 here. I see you breathing over there but I'm not set to deliver any more than 12. It doesn't lock them out like that. It will react in some way. And so in this case, the ventilator is gonna see that patient's effort and deliver the same exact set mandatory breath, 
right? And so what you end up having is a pattern of breath delivery where every single breath is a mandatory breath type, right? And that is whether the patient turned it on or the ventilator turned it on. And that pattern of breath delivery is what assist control is. So when you say, when you hear, when you're communicating within rounds and that sort of, uh, that sort of idea, and you say, oh, the patient's on assist control, what that means to me, because there's a lot of slang in here within the, especially within the ventilator terminology, and we'll kind of sort through that a little bit. Um, but when they say assist control, all they're saying is the pattern of breath delivery is all mandatory breaths, all right? And so that, therein lies what assist control is, and that's it. We have to be much more descriptive beyond that, all right? In that, that idea is part two of this mode of mechanical ventilation is that you got to tell me, we have to communicate about, well, how are each one of those mandatory breaths delivered to the patient? And I think this is where we kind of get into the nitty gritty and what we have commonality with is, oh, is that volume control? Is that pressure control? And are these ideas? And so you can choose either one of them, right? And so if the volume is set for every single mandatory breath, whether it's patient triggered or ventilator triggered, each one of those breaths will clearly be at that set title volume. And what you have is the description of that, um, that, that, oh my gosh, what did I press on here? There we go, okay. All right, so what I think is you have this description of it's all mandatory breaths, it's assist control, and then each one of the breaths are volume. And so you have a two-part name, assist ACVC is essentially what it is. And depending on where you are, your institution, I want to go backwards safely. There we go. So depending on where you are at your institution, this may be, may be termed, and I know it is at mine, we're in this turning the cruise ship terminology. They'll just say, oh, the patient's on assist control, right? And that to everybody in the adult ICUs, because we conventionally use volume means, oh, they're probably on volume, ACVC. It's really strange because in my world, I could leave the adult cardiac ICU and walk, I don't know, down the hall, up a flight of steps, and I'll land in my NICU, and, they, and those, same, those people will say, oh, the baby's on assist control. Same exact thing. But we never use volume in babies. We only use pressure in babies. And so that's where that slang gets really, really messy. Depending on what you conventionally use, we typically just shorten it to say assist control and we understand its volume, but it's quite dangerous, quite dangerous. Uh, at the FDA, just a little tidbit nugget, there's 298 registered modes of mechanical ventilation at the FDA. There's probably about five. They got 298 names, and so everybody, every ventilator can call it something different. And so when you're talking about generic ideas and generic nomenclature, that's where it becomes really important especially as you're crossing over into different places within the same institution, all right? And so beyond volume control or beyond VCAC, essentially, uh, you have the possibility where you, you would set an inspiratory pressure to be delivered, right? And so that inspiratory pressure would be delivered at every single one of the mandatory breaths, whether it's time triggered or the ventilator turns it on or whether the patient requested it and turned it on. Doesn't matter, they're all the same set inspiratory pressure breaths. And so that takes on the, the naming convention of PCAC, right? And so what you've described is not only the pattern, assist control, but what is the control variable for each one of those breaths, all right? And that's really, really kind of the boiling down of the mandatory modes of mechanical ventilation. For a little bit of time purposes, is anybody familiar with PRVC? Uh, something in that ballpark. It, PRVC is the, I would say, is the newest mode of mechanical ventilation that's been on the market, although it's been out for about 15 years. And so what it's lended itself to is that every single ventilator company does this mode of mechanical ventilation. It's not just on one vent or another vent, but it literally has about 12 different names for the same exact thing, depending on what machine is actually sitting beside the patient's bed. That is another type of mandatory breath. So it would be uh, AC pressure regulated volume control, right? That would be the longhand name of it. For a little bit of timing purposes, I've left it out here. Um, I think it's gaining some traction. I think what you need to know about that is if a patient is somewhat passive with their ventilation, each one of those breaths are a pressure control breath. 
The difference is, is that you don't, as the operator or the respiratory therapist, don't set the pressure to be delivered with each breath. What is happening is that the ventilator determines the pressure level. It will deliver, we'll just make up the number, it will deliver a pressure control of 15. What you have set on the ventilator is a targeted volume. I would like 200 cc's to come out, 300, whatever the number is. So let's just make up the number 400 cc's. That's an ask of the ventilator. I'd like you to achieve 400 cc's. All the breaths are mandatory, but the ventilator will then deliver pressure control of 15. And let's say that only 200 comes out. You have on the number, on the setting, 400. The ventilator says, whoa, I did not achieve what you asked me to do. And then on the very next breath, it increases its pressure level to try to achieve that higher volume that you asked it to get. So it's kind of a self-titrating, breath-to-breath -breath pressure control. And that's what PRVC is. If your patient's passive, then it's just, the, there's no big shifting or titration of, of inspiratory pressure levels. So it looks a lot like pressure control. It really has a whole lot of nuance and a whole lot of detail as patients become more and more and more active, especially as they become uh, distressed and have vigorous inspiration, it behaves badly, is essentially kind of what I want to point out there. It deserves a, an entire focus. I'm happy to have the conversation if we're, into, if we're inquisitive about it, um, but if we're not using a whole bunch of it, I'll kind of keep going through. Are we okay with that? You good? Okay. All right. So uh, we'll go with the two as opposed to the three, the third being that PRVC flavor. All right. And so you have these two main types of mandatory modes of mechanical ventilation. All right. And so in VCAC, we have two, clearly two oxygenators, oxygen, uh, FiO2 and PEEP, and we have two ventilators, the rate and the volume. This is probably in red there is probably, and I go through the exercise of just doing this, even though it's somewhat super basic, right? But when you set a tidal volume and you walk away and say, okay, the patient's gonna get this volume and you walk away with only that understanding, I think what you're doing is cutting yourself short from the physics of what's going on, especially as it becomes more important with patient interaction, right? When we first put patients on ECMO, they're not super interactive and this can kind of fly by and, and perform perfectly fine. However, the physics, what it demands of you, if you set a volume, you have to set a flow rate. You have to, right? And you have to tell the ventilator how fast to put that volume in. So you can't get beyond it. That's the physics of what's happening with breath delivery. So if you set a volume, you are made to set a flow. That becomes impactful because that flow will not change in the face of any patient demand. Right? And I'll kind of preface this as we go forward. We'll hopefully get to the point where we talk about it a little bit more in spontaneous ventilation on ECMO. But if, a, if you put a straw in a Frosty or a really thick milkshake and you go like that, suck it in really hard, the Frosty isn't going to come up the straw as quick as you are sucking it in, right? So right now we can make the idea that you have an inspiratory Frosty demand or a flow demand, you want that flow at that particular speed, we'll say 90 liters a minute. But if that flow is only set on 50 liters a minute, it does not respond. It comes up at that very, very slow flow rate. Meanwhile, the patient on the other end is pulling really vigorously. And it sets up this really, really, it can become dangerous and can become injurious, but really uncomfortable mismatch, right? And so there's all kinds of physiologic implications to that too, because if I asked you what happened to the straw of when you were sucking the milkshake through there, your pulling is really, really hard. What happens to the straw? It collapses and it collapses because of negative pressure. That is what's felt within the intrathoracic space is that negative pressure because the pleural space is pulling so hard in a negative fashion and you create that mismatch and it has, you know, hemodynamic consequences at, at that point, right? You're, uh, we won't go very much more into that, but when you see somebody and you're managing them on the ventilator and you have ACVC, uh, I think what I wanna make the impression is, it's just not as simple as, oh, I'm gonna set the volume and that's what they're gonna get and wrap that up and walk away. 
Like you are locking them into certain things. And the most important one being the flow, all right? So the pressure is variable. I think that's fairly intuitive, right? And so if you're gonna set the volume, uh, then you will have no control over the pressure. The pressure is whatever the pressure is gonna be at that particular point. So that in red is what you have to kind of feel your way through in terms of using these modes of mechanical ventilation. If you're gonna use PCAC, the oxygenators are exactly the same. And then when we come over to ventilation, you clearly have a set respiratory rate. The difference here is that you will now set an inspiratory pressure to be delivered with each one of those. And the physics determine is, determines these dependent variables. So if I set the pressure, what is variable is volume. And we are, I feel like, quite familiar and okay with that idea. The exact opposite and vice versa of when we set volume and pressure was variable. So if I say, mm, I'm gonna set pressure, the volume is variable, but what is really underneath of there is that so is the flow. The flow is variable. And so you take that situation of that patient really vigorously inspiring and looking really uncomfortable. Uh, I think the most common terminology, oh, the patient's bucking the ventilator, they're really, Maybe you have that other oh, dyssynchronous with the ventilator or something's out of whack, something like that. And so what you're hearing is, wow, the patient isn't matched up with the ventilator. What is happening? It's primarily that flow problem that I was talking about. When we lock volume, we lock flow, we have that issue. And then we'll switch the pressure. The flow is variable now. So if they pull in really hard, you take that part of the equation out of it right? It becomes a little bit more comfortable because if they want a really fast breath, it's going to be delivered to them. The ventilator will allow that flow to be really, really fast in the face of their changing demand. The problem is, though, is that if they pull in a lot of flow, that is volume. And now you have no control over the volume, and so the volume can become really, really excessive. So there's no magic bullet, and that, that idea that there's no magic bullet actually lies within the details, the really, really specific and kind of granular details underneath. But I think I've just kind of covered the surface. It's, all, it's based on that flow. It's based on the, the idea of do you control flow or don't you control flow? And it's wrapped up in that name that is kind of hidden underneath of there. It's never ordered. It's not a variable that any, uh, any physician is ever going to write. Oh, I want the flow to be this. This is your bedside respiratory therapist or whoever's managing that ventilator looking at them and saying, ooh, that doesn't look right, and just making granular, minute uh, changes to that to try to keep up with them, okay? So that's what's going on uh, underneath and behind the scenes. Um, going down the spontaneous side, so clearly there is no set rate with the spontaneous modes of mechanical ventilation, so your patient has to have, a, have an intact respiratory drive. They're gonna determine their own rate. And what you're able to do at this particular time is understand or, or determine, am I going to give them assistance or am I not going to give them assistance, right? And so really that kind of wraps itself into, if they're on CPAP, there is no inspiratory assistance or no volume augmentation that is provided from the mechanical ventilator. They are breathing all of their own rate, clearly, because there's no set rate, but there is no inspiratory pressure with that. It is one continuous positive airway pressure. So you're just establishing essentially a lung volume, right? And that's what they're breathing on top of, all right? So it's the spontaneous version of PEEP, if you, if you so will, all right? You take all the volume, all the pressure, all the rate off of PEEP, and that's what CPAP is. And now they have to do all of those things, all right? In that event that you are unhappy with that particular volume or the work of breathing that is incurred by the patient while they are breathing on CPAP, you can choose or elect to provide assistance to them. The ventilator monitors for the patient's effort and then will put in the inspiratory pressure. And just one little teeny tiny note about this is that it's the exact same inspiratory pressure that you're setting with pressure control. There's nothing magical about a PC of 15 versus a PS of 15. They're exactly the same, all right? And I see this all the time. Oh, the patient looks really bad on pressure support of 15. Let's put them on pressure control of 15. Uh, and I'm like, that doesn't compute in any way because if they're breathing, then there's zero difference between the two of them 
other than really, really fine details of how the breath ends, okay? So just kind of take that away. For instance, in Europe, uh, they, they manage everybody on pressure support. And if they want to rest them, they'll use a high level of pressure support. And if they want them to become more active, they'll use a lower level of pressure support, right? And so pressure support, I think what the big misnomer is, is that we take away, we walk away from the idea of pressure support saying, oh, the patient is weaning from the ventilator, right? Or they're doing more and more work on their own. And I wanna leave you with the impression that that is not always the case, all right? If you are providing all of their volume for gas exchange that you have to do in that case, uh, coinciding with whatever you're doing on the membrane, uh, and you're alleviating work, then that is a resting mode of ventilation, right? So don't take anything serious and big away from the idea of pressure support. The next question is, well, what level of pressure support are they on? That's what you need, right? If they're on a really low level, that indicates to you less than 10, 10 or less. That indicates to you that patient is doing a lot of the work. If the patient's on pressure support of 12 or greater, you're probably augmenting and offloading much of the work of breathing on their behalf, all right? So there's a little bit something more, even in pressure support, that's underneath it there. I'm gonna strip away the rate, and that's what you're left with in terms of oxygenation and ventilation settings, okay? APRV, anybody using APRV? Yeah, love it, hate it. Nobody, yeah, it's good, it's good. Uh, so, um, so I'll give you the impression from my world. Um, APRV is a big scary thing that nobody knows how to manage. So we kind of put it out there into this like, I don't know that I wanna use it, it seems really advanced. Uh, and we're going to kind of shy away from it. We'll use it as a very last resort, and hopefully somebody knows what they're doing with it type of thing, right? Um, there are facilities that use it from start to end on regularly mechanically ventilated patients, much less patients that are on ECMO for it, all right? Um, so we'll dive into this APRV, talk about some of the settings and kind of uh, get us, you know, I guess a little bit on the same page and balanced with what's going on. Um, there is no data whatsoever in mechanical ventilation on ECMO ver or outside of ECMO for any mode working better than any other mode. I think that's the other thing that you kind of got to come away with. You, if you stay within the guidelines of volume and pressure, it doesn't matter how you put that in, you're going to be okay. It is the nuance of how the patient's interacting that makes one mode more advantageous for that patient versus this patient and so on and so forth. So in the end, you need to have all of the arsenal in your back pocket because there's gonna come a day that volume control isn't working for this patient because of the flow problem, because of all of these other issues and you do have to switch the pressure and that may not work and you may have to go to all these other alternatives and just as long as you're following the rules, then that's okay. They each have their own little nuance to them. So let's talk about APRV just a little bit Essentially, we're gonna flip the graph upside down. Instead of PEEP being down at the bottom, and we are at PEEP or during exhalation for a prolonged period of time, and inspiration is fairly short, we're gonna flip it upside down, and we're gonna put in the pressure and hold it for a longer period of time. I hesitate to use inspiration because it's really not inspiration versus exhalation, but we'll go there and then we'll separate it afterwards. So you have two really primary settings when we're talking about putting the pressure in and holding it. One of them is called P-high, and one of them is called T-high, and that is pressure and time. I have to tell the ventilator how much pressure to put in and then how long to hold it in, right? There are, if we wanna kind of think about it and boil it down to its least common denominator and make it really easy, there are a number of ways that you can recruit the lung open. You can do it with pressure, and you can do it with time, and you can do it with position, meaning I can prone them, all right? So pressure, time, and position. And you have to leverage each one of those to your benefit for whatever is gonna be okay with that particular patient. Sometimes you're using all of them. The fourth best one we'll get to, and that we'll leave it as a little cliffhanger uh, at the end, but it's what APRV also leverages. So we'll use P-high pressure, that is a, on the surface in front of mind thing, that's easy. Yeah, if I put in a higher pressure, I'm gonna open the lung up and recruit it more. But the longer you keep it open, 
the more lung you will also recruit, right? And so the longer I keep that P high in equals more and more and more and more lung that I'm gonna open up, all right? Different than on conventional ventilation when, when inspiration usually lasts a little bit less than a second. Sometimes alveoli will not recruit for another three, four, five seconds as that pressure is applied during inspiration. And so that's what APRV is leveraging in that case. The other two settings are on the bottom of it, essentially. So you have the top and then you have the bottom. The other two settings on the bottom are exactly in contrast, the P-low and the T-low. Those are exceptionally short. And if we think about it like this, well, I'm gonna do all of this work, spend all of this time and pressure to open your lung, I sure do not want to let it collapse when I have to exchange fresh gas out of the lung and then back in, right? And the longer you, that time is down at the lower pressure, the more prone your lung is to just close up. So we will drop down to a lower pressure uh, identified by the PLO, but that time is exceedingly short, less than a second. And in your sick, sick patients that are on ECMO, when we run it, when we're, we're able to effectively manage the patients on APRV, uh, those T lows are like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. They're really, really, really super short, right? And the premise behind it and why is because you do not want the lung to collapse, all right? You have to exchange gas. You got to get the bad gas out, more fresh gas in, but you have to do it in a really exceptionally short period of time or else you're going to lose all the work that you managed to do, all right? So what you end up having is a little bit of a uh, different idea, right? So if I said, what ventilator setting do you use to recruit the lung open? I feel pretty good and confident that most people would say PEEP. Oh, we use PEEP, that's what gets the lung open, right? In APRV, that is not the case. It is not the bottom pressure that is the recruiter of the lung. The P high is the recruiter of the lung. That's what opens your lung and maintains and establishes a lung volume, right? So that can be really high, it can be low, it can be in the middle of the ballpark, but you have to get off of the bottom thinking and go to the top. That is your recruiter, right? What you do on the bottom, that is just a stabilizer, right? So if I take my P-low from zero to five to eight to 10, I am not recruiting any more lung opening. The lung is opened with the P-high of 25 or 30 or whatever it is, all right? So that thinking is also inversed and flipped upside down. And I think that's where a lot of people get into in terms of management of it or like, ooh, all right, I got to think too much about this. I'm, I don't want to do this, right? This is a little bit too complicated. And so they tend to shy away from that. But the idea that you're using pressure and time in the face of of, of abnormal alveolar behavior is one of the best recruiters for you, all right? So we'll leave it at that. I said the, there's a fourth recruiter and that fourth recruiter is the patient. They are probably the best recruiter because when their diaphragm contracts, it slides down their dorsal, uh, or their dorsal wall. Right? And so if you think about it, a patient laying in the supine position with gravity uh, and fluid movement, their dorsal lung segments become really, really atelectatic and collapsed. Right? That's where all of the infiltrate and all of the collapse is. And when the diaphragm contracts, it slides down that back dorsal wall and it recruits all of those alveoli open. It has less slide along the anterior wall, more slide along that dorsal wall. So, when you ask a patient to breathe, they are going to recruit their lung open very, very well, much more and much more effectively than what you can ever do with pressure and time, all right? They are such a much better recruiter. So if you are able to allow a patient to spontaneously breathe, that is an awesome thing because they're really good at doing what they should be doing, all right? We're only a stand-in at that particular time with the ventilator. So if you can let them spontaneously breathe, we go for it. But if you can couple spontaneous breathing with this higher pressure and this longer time, now you're kind of talking about like, I'm taking all of the concepts and ideas of opening the lung up and putting them all together in one nice little package and we'll name it APRV. So the P-high is put in for an extended period of time 
the, the way that the ventilator behaves, it allows the patient to spontaneously breathe at that P high. So you kind of roll all of the advantages and all of the ways to recruit the lung open up into this one singular mode called APRV, okay? So this is what you end up with. I think that is my, uh, my explanation to APRV if, we're, if we do not want to go any further into that, all right? Is that cool? All right, I'm going to kind of cruise through this a little bit. I have no idea what, oh my word. All right, uh, so we got about 10 minutes. I'm going to cruise through the lung, and I'm sorry, guys, online, because I'm going to go through the ventilator-induced lung injury, how we hurt the lung, and we're going to kind of come to the end. So I'm going to flip a little fast, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but I'm going to do it anyway. All right, so we're going to get to this idea, and we covered a lot of this yesterday, the same, same ideas, but I want to get to the point where we can sum this up, and I think that is right there. All right, you have a couple different ways that you hurt the lung. You can put too much volume in, that's volume trauma. We monitor for that by way of a plateau pressure. Right? We do not want the alveolar pressure any more than 30, typically. That's off of every guideline, whether it's on ECMO or off of ECMO. Uh, on ECMO, we tend to even be more conservative and pull that end inspiratory alveolar pressure even lower to like 25, right? But most of the population over distends and has too much volume at their lung, in their lung when the alveolar or plateau pressure reaches 30. Down at the bottom, you have something called adelect trauma. And what that is, is when the lung de-recruits or the alveolus collapses at exhalation, on the subsequent inspiration, what happens is that the ventilator puts in whatever breath is gonna be coming in and the alveolus is reopened. So it goes from an open position during inspiration to a closed position during exhalation. That opening and reopening is something called repetitive alveolar collapse and expansion. We call it race injury, but that's what it is, repetitive alveolar collapse and expansion. And when the alveolus reopens, it's not a delicate little, let me get this thing open again. It's a rip open, right? And it causes a huge amount of shear stress, almost to the point, if you think about the shear stress on a vascular wall, and you have development of aneurysm, it is the same exact thing. If you take a grape and you squeeze it, what ends up happening is because of the pressure, the skin rips, that's what's happening at your alveolar walls, all right? Every time it reopens, it's undergoing that shear stress. So if you can keep it open, you avoid that mechanism of injury, and you keep it open with PEEP in the more conventional standpoint. I think that's what we understand conventionally in terms of lung injury. Don't hurt them up top and don't hurt them down at the bottom. And what you do in between, I made a point yesterday, is probably the most important one. And that is what a driving pressure is, or the difference between your PEEP and your plateau, right? That's what a driving pressure is. You do not want that to exceed 14, all right? That is where the relative risk of death and your hazard ratios start to go upwards, okay? Good enough, so that's what separates us out. I do want to kind of go into this idea here that we have to personalize mechanical ventilation uh, as we go forward, right? And the way that we personalize mechanical ventilation on the outset is driving pressure. That's, that's the first most obvious one, right? Because if we put too much volume in, the plateau does go higher. But if we put the right volume in and the plateau is low, it doesn't mean that everything is okay. And I think that's what we have to take away from. Can you hurt someone at a plateau that's less than 30? And can a, someone with a plateau higher than 30 actually be safe? And that answer is yes and yes. You, you can absolutely hurt someone. One mechanism is by the way of driving pressure because you're stretching the lung from its initial point at the beginning of inspiration to the end of inspiration, you're stretching it too much. If you stretch it more than 14 centimeters of water, that's too much. Right? Even if you're on a peep of 10 and a plateau of 24, which is, I think, right around most people's mechanical ventilation strategy on ECMO, that is the upper limit of driving pressure. Anything more than 14, they start to have an increased mortality. Right? And so you want to keep that smaller. The way we do that is to peel away volume or decrease the pressure setting. Either way, you're going to accept less volume to stretch the alveolus from beginning to end. Five? Zero? Okay, good. 
I was asking about the time. All right, so the other way that we can personalize this is by way of transpulmonary pressure. And I think the research on this is, is exploding. It's ever emerging. Um, I get calls every week, hey, can you, can you tell us how to do this? Um, and more and more and more people are, are doing it. The, um, the transpulmonary pressure is starting to be built into the ventilators, right? And, and has made it uh, available on a much larger scale. Uh, and so we use transpulmonary pressure to guide mechanical ventilation. And it's actually the gold standard for lung injury, right? And if we think that the plateau pressure of 30, that's where it is. Well, the plateau pressure of 30 is relative to what's happening around the outside of the lung. And we assume it to be negligible, meaning there's no contribution from the chest wall. However, in many patients, there is a huge contribution to the chest wall. And so... It's by way of measuring esophageal pressure. So it's a, it's a validated measurement. So it's a gastric tube. It's a normal, fully functioning 16 French gastric tube. The only difference is, is that about 20 centimeters from the bottom, there's a balloon on it, right? And the balloon communicates with the outside. I'm able to put air in it and we can transduce it. And we can know the pressure within the esophagus. That balloon sits about two thirds of the way down the esophagus. Uh, and more importantly, it is directly in a retrocardiac position, right? And so that's where, the valid, that's where the measurements validate it from. If it's too high or too low, the balloon I'm referring to, then, the, then whatever, you'll measure pressure. You always will measure pressure, but it's not the right, it's not what you're after. It's gotta be right there in that exact space. So it takes a little bit of technique and there's a bit of technicality to it, but placed in the right position, you will measure the esophageal pressure in the retrocardiac position. At that point, that is reflective in a surrogate for pleural pressure or what is surrounding the outside of the lung. And so in PEEP and during exhalation, we will measure the pleural pressure. And this is how we guide what PEEP setting we are. So if I have PEEP in the alveolus at 12, and that's what's holding the alveolus open. If, we, if I say, hey, what does PEEP do? And you close your eyes and what you think about is, there's something, there's a pressure holding the alveolus open. That's what PEEP's job is. However, if the pressure surrounding the alveolus pushing in overcomes and is higher than what is inside holding it open, then the result is going to be collapse. And now you have the mechanisms and the, the etiology of lung injury at that point. And you do not have enough PEEP. So if we can measure the pleural pressure, and I can tell you, hey, the pleural pressure is 18 and that's what's squeezing in, then now we know we, where we need to set the PEEP to. And at this case, we would come at least even, if not a little bit above it, right? Give us a little bit of cushion. And so in this case, if this were, these were our measurements and this is the cartoon and I got 18, I'm turning the PEEP, we'll go to 20. We go about two above to start with, all right? And that's how we'll hold, hold the lung open. Anything else? You would just have a white x-ray, probably struggling with gas exchange, struggling with oxygenation. And it's because your lung is collapsed. You have shunt units all over the place and you're not, you're not using the lung, all right? So that's how we use the transpulmonary pressure. On the other side of things, we also use it to understand what are our end inspiratory stretch limitations. So if we think about a balloon and we put the gas into the balloon and we measure the pressure at the end of a, us putting the gas in, that being inspiration, and we call that a plateau, that isn't how your lung is working, right? Your lung has a balloon and then it is surrounded by a larger balloon on the outside, meaning your thoracic cage and your pleural space. So it's a balloon in series and in sequence and you're just inflating the interior one. If there's nothing in the big balloon around the outside, meaning there's no fluid, there's no extra air, there's nothing in there, then whatever pressure that you're using to inflate the inside or the small balloon on the inside is the real and true pressure. However, if I filled that big balloon with water or I put some rubber bands around the big balloon and then put gas into that little small balloon inside, it will emit a huge pressure but is it something wrong with the little balloon or is it something wrong with the big balloon around the outside? The ventilator can't tell you that. It can't separate what those are. The esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressure does. 
So I can tell you, oh, there's 22 centimeters of water of pressure around the outside of the lung. And what that results in, these really, really high pleural pressures, is that your plateau pressure read at the ventilator will be really exceptionally high. And so if the plateau pressure is 34, all of us are walking away from that saying, oh my God, that's way too high. You gotta turn down the inspiratory pressure, you gotta take away volume, with all of the consequence that goes with that, right? Taking all of that away isn't free. It costs something at that point, right? So you, you are made to react on a number that isn't a very good number in that case. But when you're able to elucidate what is the contribution of pleural pressure and separately what is the contribution of alveolar pressure, now you can understand and you wouldn't react in this case because the difference between the inside and the outside is 12, and I would deem the most is 15, and I would deem this, oh, your plateau pressure is fine. It's totally fine. You can walk away from that and say, that's okay. And so you reestablish normals for that individual patient's body habitus and their lung mechanics and their chest wall pressure. All right? Is that my timer? <laughs> All right. So, um, I think I got into a little bit of the details, a little different than what the overview of what I talked about yesterday. Do I have any time for a question?